<laughs> Thank you, Pat, for that introduction. Uh, so I am going to try and attempt to reverse engineer the galaxy formation problem. And I'm going to try to do it with the help of these people. The first half of my talk is going to be on the subject of galaxy voids uh, with this pe these people on a paper that was recently on the archive. And the second part of my talk is I'm going to take uh, the same sort of uh, techniques and apply it to the to magnesium two absorption systems. And these are two papers that I've recently done with Xiao and Chen, which you can find on the archive as recently as yesterday. So uh, if you have a really big computer and you are very confident in your assumption that omega baryon is exactly zero, then uh, the universe is a pretty tractable problem. Because for you know, a given set of cosmological parameters, we can actually, uh, we actually know what the linear matter power spectrum is uh, to a very high degree. And we can put down a Gaussian random field very well and run an n-body simulation under the force of gravity, and this is what you get. So this is a slice plot through a simulation by Mac Warren, and it's got all the features that we come to know and love through Lambda CDM. You've got your big cluster here, you've got your filament here, and you've got your big void in the center. And you can try and uh, um, quantify this mass distribution through something a little more statistical, like the two-point correlation function, given uh, over here, where this is the uh, separation between pairs here, and uh, uh, the probability of finding a pair above random here. So this is your universe to your computer, maybe even to your laptop these days. However, if you have a telescope, uh, the universe looks quite different. So now I've put galaxies on top of the dark matter in a way such that now the galaxies have the same luminosity function as the two-degree field galaxy redshift survey. So that's the points with different types. And uh, I also, they also have the same uh, clustering properties, the luminosity-dependent clustering, as that galaxy redshift survey. So then if I calculate the two-point correlation function for these galaxies, you can tell, first of all, that it's all not the same. Uh, the clustering depends on the luminosity of the tracer that you're looking at. These are brighter galaxies, and these are the fainter galaxies, so it goes monotonically down with luminosity. And also that it's not the same as the dark matter, which you can see sort of underneath the blue line there. So this is what we call galaxy bias, that the clustering of the galaxies is different from the clustering of the underlying dark matter. So it depends on the luminosity, but it also depends on the scale. You can tell this bias is dependent on where you're actually calculating or measuring your clustering statistic. So if you have observations of this and you want to get information about the, what's going on underneath it, you need a quantifiable model of galaxy bias. So now the problem of galaxy formation, you can tackle it a lot of different ways. One of the tried and true methods that people have been doing for a long time are uh, hydrodynamic simulations where now you, you bump omega matter or excuse me, omega baryon slightly above zero and you try and put into your best guess star formation physics and feedback and you run it forward in the hopes that you'll get a galaxy that looks exactly like the, what we have today. Now, we haven't exactly solved this problem yet, but one of the main inferences that we get from a simulation like this is that basically we always find the galaxies inside of the halos. So here's one of the larger uh, halos from this simulation run by David Weinberg and collaborators. So the little black points are all the dark matter particles, and then the blue and red dots are the clumps of baryons, and so these are the galaxies. So at the center of your dark matter halo, you've got one big galaxy at the center. You've got mm, less luminous galaxies sort of scattered around the outskirts, distributed essentially the same as the dark matter themselves. So obviously this is not, you know, a really exciting statement. It's not going to shock anybody here. But the idea that galaxies always form inside of the halos actually has far-reaching implications about how we can model galaxy bias itself, which brings me to the halo occupation distribution. I'm sure you have all heard this now, the acronym HOD. Well, I'm going to have to, you know, just give a little review on what this actually is. It is a statistical prescription for the connection between galaxies and dark matter halos. It essentially takes the problem of galaxy bias and pushes it off of the galaxies and onto the halos. Because we know all about dark matter halos. We've got a bazillion simulations now which tell us exactly what the dark matter mass function, the halo mass function is, what the bias relation is for these, for these, no, excuse me, for these <clears throat> halos, and what their internal density structures look like. So if I now have a mapping which tells me how many galaxies I put in each halo, and I know all about the halos, I've essentially exactly specified the distribution of galaxies on all, on all scales. Right, uh, yes, you have to make some assumptions about, say, whether or not the galaxies are distributed inside of a halo the same as the dark matter. So you make an assumption about that, and then once you've made that assumption, I've specified what the model, what the model is, the de uh, assumption-dependent model is, what the galaxy bias is on all scales. Uh, now, there are pros and cons to this approach. One con is obviously you have to make certain assumptions. Uh, another con that people level at me all the time is that there's no galaxy formation physics involved. And I will be the first to admit it, there is no physics involved. I'm not a physicist, I'm merely a statistician. 
however, one of the main advantages of an approach like this is that there's no galaxy formation physics involved. It's, galaxy formation is a really, really tough problem. That's why we all have jobs and why I had so many jobs that I could apply for this fall. Um, but if you know exactly uh, how many galaxies go, or what galaxies go in what halos, and you know exactly what the formation histories of the halos are from our n-body simulations, you can make pretty strong uh, assessments about what must have happened in the galaxy formation process in order to get the distribution that we see today. That's why I call it reverse engineering the problem. Okay, so I gotta get a bit into the guts of the HUD, and it's mainly this quantity here. Pn of m, the probability that a halo of mass m contains n galaxies. Now you can create a different Pn of m for uh, any set, any class of galaxies that you define. You're just gonna have a different Pn of m for, for say, galaxies defined brighter than L star, brighter than 2L star, red galaxies brighter than L star, it doesn't matter. You always just create a different Pn of m for every set of galaxies by your definition. So if we go back to that hydrodynamic simulation I showed a couple of slides ago, you can look directly at Pn of m for the entire simulation. So this is halo mass on the x-axis and the number of galaxies in each halo on the y-axis. So if you look at 10 to the 13 solar masses here, most halos have one, some have two, three, four, whatever, sort of a roughly Poissonian distribution. And the blue line then is just binning things up as a function of mass. So this is what we call the mean occupation function. Now what we do in practice is that we break it up in two distinct components. First being the central galaxies. That's obviously the one sitting at the center of mass of the halo. That's a special location. It's also a special number because you can't have more than one central galaxy per halo, and it has special clustering properties with respect to the other galaxies around it. So we start with an occupation function, quote unquote, for the central galaxies, you know, something that rises from zero up to one, where this shape is really a probe of the scatter between, say, mass and luminosity. And at higher masses, you only have one central galaxy per halo, so this is always one. Now, as you increase in halo mass, you go from just being only massive enough to have one galaxy to starting to be massive enough to house some satellite galaxies. So that's what this function is here. And the number of satellite galaxies scales roughly proportionately with, with the halo mass. And you add the two together, and you get the mean occupation function that you got over there. So we know how to parameterize this mean occupation function. We take the parameters from, you know, the parameterizations we get from, say, semi-analytic models uh, or hydrodynamic simulations, which is what's shown here, but then we go back to the data and actually leave it as free parameters to be constrained empirically by the data so we know what the shape of this is for galaxies are in the real universe. Here's an example of that. So we always start with measurements, or at least I always start with measurements of the two-point correlation function of galaxies. So this is the projected two-point correlation function for Sloan galaxies brighter than 21, minus 21 R band. That's the points with error bars. And uh, the solid line is the best fit HOD model constrained by that data. Uh, so when you're modeling a, a two-point correlation function in terms of a halo-based approach, uh, your pairs of galaxies come from two distinct terms. When you're in small scales, so here's one megaparsec here, inside of one megaparsec, your pairs are very close together, so they come from inside of one halo. You have a central paired with a satellite, or two satellites paired with each other. Now eventually your projected separation is going to get bigger than the scale of the largest halo. And at that point, all of your pairs of galaxies are gonna come from two distinct halos, and that's what we call the two halo term. So in between one halo pairs and two halo pairs, there is this transition region at about an omega parsec set by the cutoff in the halo mass function. And uh, so there's going to be a little bit of a transition region which you will see in your model. So if you take the data and divide it by its best fit power law, that's what you get down here. The data show distinct uh, deviations from a power law that are statistically significant, and they are exactly explained by the shape induced by this transition from one halo pairs to two halo pairs. So that's a nifty little result that came out of early results of applying this to Sloan data. But what I like to do with it is once you have the two-point correlation function, you fit this model, which gives you this shape. You now know the number of galaxies per halo mass. And, now, and then I can use this function to make predictions to test the underlying assumptions that I made, because I obviously had to make assumptions here. One assumption I made is about the cosmology, the cosmological model. So you can test cosmology this way, or you can test your own underlying assumptions about galaxy bias itself. Now, when I wrote down Pn of m, I made a really strong assumption, actually, that the number of galaxies in a halo depends on mass and only depends on mass, that it doesn't depend on any other quantity. So more formally, you would present this question as, are the properties of a galaxy in the halo of mass m 
determined only by the halo mass. What about the other halo properties, specifically the environment in which that forms? Because the environment in which a halo forms determines its, uh, its accretion history, its assembly history. And it's now been shown in recent years through a lot of papers that actually uh, the assembly history does influence, or at least the bias of halos does correlate with environment. Or not the bias, the bias of halos does correlate with the properties of the halo. So here is one example of this from Riso Wexler and collaborators where they're looking at halos from an n-body series of n-body simulations. So they've been things up in terms of mass here on the x-axis. And now this is bias on the y-axis. So they've divided out actually what the mass dependent bias is because now they want to take fixed mass bins and divide them up by a secondary property, a second parameter. And their second parameter is concentration. So red line is high concentrated halos, which will be correlated with old halos. And black will be uh, low concentrated halos, which would be correlated with young halos. So at fixed mass, if you bin things by concentration, you know that there is actually a strong dependence of the, of the bias with the concentration. Old high concentrated halos are very highly biased when you're at low mass. And young halos are less, uh, and young halos are less clustered than the overall mean at that mass. And then at high masses, the situation inverts itself. So uh, that's the situation in dark matter halos. And Darren Croton decided to see whether or not he could find if this assembly bias, as they now call it, propagates from the halos and into the galaxy population itself. So he's got a semi-analytic model of galaxy formation. And you know, so he knows what the clustering is of the galaxies in the simulation are. And he wants to see if halo occupation now correlates with environment. So what he did is he, cal he calculates the, the galaxy clustering in the semi-analytic model. And then he takes uh, the galaxies from each halo, from some halo of mass m, and randomly reassigns it to another halo of the same mass. So this quantity is conserved. It's not changed at all. But if, uh, if environment did have an effect, he simply wiped that out. He calls this the shuffle test. So you shuffle the galaxies around between halos of like mass. You recalculate the clustering and see if there's a difference. And these are the results here. So this is now separation between galaxy pairs and the ratio, the square root of the ratio at least, between these two correlation functions. And there is, in fact, a difference between the shuffled and original galaxy clustering. So if he defines his samples by luminosity, there's a you know, really small effect here, maybe of order a couple of percent. These are the black lines. But if he further defines his, uh, he breaks it up by color, red and blue galaxies, there's a much stronger effect. So halo occupation for red and blue galaxies now seems to depend on environment. And if you further break this down to only look at the central galaxies, now it becomes a whoppingly big effect. That's what this plot is down here, only the central galaxies. So it seems that assembly bias, at least in his semi-analytic model, affects the amplitude of the correlation function by almost a factor of two. So we know this effect is in the halos. We predict that it might be in the galaxies. So how can we actually go out into the real universe and try and find it? Which brings me to the subject of voids. So this is the populated n-body simulation as we showed you at the very beginning. And voids are simply regions in which there would be very few, if any, galaxies. Something like this, like this, or like this. So when I first began my thesis, uh, voids were going to be the entire thesis. We thought voids were going to be great to, to tell us all about uh, cosmological parameters or constrained bias, that this was going to be a very useful tool. Now, while uh, voids are good for some things, voids are actually really suck at being able to constrain cosmology or bias. And uh, I explain that through this triptych here. So once again, I start with uh, observations of the two-point correlation function. That's the points with error bars. They come from Sloan. And the solid gray line are 20 different fits to this correlation function. So they're all on top of each other because they're all good fits. They all have delta chi squared less than 1. These are the 20 HODs. This is supposed to be an N. These are the 20 HODs that produce those 20 fits. So you can see at the high mass end, we're pretty well constrained. But at the low mass end, there's some degeneracy. So some cutoffs are really sharp. Some cutoffs are smooth. As I said earlier, this is really relative to the scatter between mass and luminosity. Um, and so the thought was, well, if some of these begin to probe low density or low mass halos, you might be able to break these degeneracies and differentiate between these models through void statistics, because that's sort of probing the low mass end of the halo mass spectrum. However, if I predict the void probability function for these 20 models, I get something which looks like this. Now, the void probability function is a very simple statistic. If I have my galaxy distribution, I plop down a random sphere in the galaxy distribution of some radius r. What is the probability that it's empty? You put down a million spheres, what percentage are, are are empty, that's your VPF. Um, and so these are the 20 VPFs for these different models. And they're all pretty much on top of each other. They're, you cannot distinguish between these within at least the precision that we can get from Sloan statistics. 
And this even is the case if I change cosmology. I change the underlying cosmology, I refit, I recalculate the VPF is, it's still exactly the same. I always get the same VPF no matter what the shape of the HOD is or the underlying cosmology. So it turns, so we thought, well, you can't really do anything with the VPF. But if it's such a robust prediction of the model, I can then use it to test the assumption I made, namely that this function is the same at all environments. So what happens if density does matter in terms of galaxy formation? So these are two uh, galaxy distributions from uh, an M-body simulation that I populated. And they both match the same two-point correlation function for Sloan uh, brighter than minus 19 galaxies. So the cyan is my standard HOD where galaxy formation is independent of environment, it only depends on halo mass, and so the halo occupation is the same whether you're here or whether you're here. Now for the gold points, I've tweaked galaxy formation efficiency a little bit. I've made galaxy formation slightly less efficient in low density regimes. So at, at the same halo mass, galaxies are fainter. Or in other words, uh, at the same, for the same luminosity threshold, the minimum mass scale goes up. So you can see now in low density regimes like down here, I've got cyan points with no corresponding gold point on top of it, but there are extra gold points sort of scattered throughout because I need to keep make sure the number density of galaxies is the same. I need to still match the luminosity function. So if I analyze these two universes under the same bag of tricks, what do I get? Well, this is the two-point correlation function for those two models. They're practically directly on top of each other. The red is the density-dependent HOD. The black was the standard HOD. And you can never differentiate between these two models based upon the two-point correlation function alone. However, if I measure the void probability function for these two models, they're quite different. The red points, the density dependent HD, has much bigger voids. And that's you know, pretty much just a tautology. I simply re removed the galaxies out of the low density regimes because I said they couldn't form there. So just by definition, I'm going to increase the size of the voids. It has a minimal impact on the two point clustering, has a major impact on the void probability function. So if the red universe was the real universe, and I went through my whole HOD scheme and analyzed it, assuming that halo occupation was uh, density independent, and made a prediction, my prediction for the void probability function would be this red line, and it would be totally off of the measurements. So I would know that something must have happened from here to here. This statistic probes the mean density and high densities, and so I constrained halo occupation from that. If my prediction is off, that must mean that something must have happened from high densities to low densities. Galaxy formation efficiency changes, halo occupation changes. So this is how we can test this under the real data. And so this is what we did with Sloan DR4. So the points with error bars are now the measurements, the new measurements of the void probability function for faint galaxies and for bright galaxies. And so <coughs> this is the, we have a slightly complementary statistic here, the under density probability distribution, which instead of the sphere in your galaxies being empty, you ask, well, is it less than 20% of the mean density? So it's almost the same, but it, it's a little bit less noisy to measure at large scales. The blue lines are the predictions I make for what the VPF should look like based upon fitting the two-point correlation function with my density independent HOD. And in all four statistics, we're doing quite a good job. There's a little bit of a blip here, but it turns out not to be statistically significant. I can get into that later, but I have a small amount of time. But mainly I want to draw your attention to the green lines where these are the models in which galaxy formation efficiency goes down in low density regimes. You're always gonna make the voids bigger and you will not be able to match any of the data. So the conclusion that you draw from, this, from these results is that the luminosity of a galaxy depends only on the mass of the halo and not on the environment in which it formed. But we do know categorically that some galaxy properties do definitely depend on environment. There's this well-known relation called the density morphology relation that red old elliptical galaxies form in dense environments. This has been known for a long time. This is from the original Dressler 1980 uh, paper where they're looking at the fraction of the population of whether a disk or elliptical galaxy is a function of environment density. So here's the mean density here. As you go from mean density into high densities, you lose all your disk galaxies and you gain all your red elliptical galaxies. And so this has now been refined with extra statistics from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So here are new results of the same thing from Cheng Bon Park and collaborators. This is now the early type fraction as a function of environment on, on the x-axis. So here's the mean density here. Each one of the lines is a different luminosity bin, and they're all parallel. And what they're concluding here is that the morphology density relation extends over all environments, even the low density regimes for all galaxies. So how do I reconcile this with an idea that galaxy formation efficiency is independent of environment? 
Or another way to, to pose it is does halo environment somehow influence galaxy color? So this is my end body simulation. The dots are now halos. I'm highlighting halos here. Red are the big massive halos, group and cluster size halos. Yes? Uh, just with better statistics and able to go. So he cuts off here at the mean density. And the mean density is here, so you're able to see whether or not it goes into low densities. Uh, th uh, these are all galaxies from Sloan. Uh, early type fraction, so you know he's got his own sort of morphological estimator, which probably differs a little bit. I mean, Dressler, I assume, probably did it by eye, and this is some sort of you know photometric process that's done on the computer. But this is also log on the x-axis, and that's linear on the on that or log, and that's linear. Okay, here's the n-body simulation, and I'm highlighting the green points are five times ten to the eleven solar mass halos. This is an important um, halo mass regime. It is the halo mass for which you would find uh, minus 19 R-band galaxies at the center. Uh, so that is the uh, galaxy luminosity with which Darren Croton finds the strongest uh, assembly bias for red galaxies. This is also the halo mass where Risa Wexler and the collaborators and everybody else doing these sort of studies find that there's a strong effect for the assembly bias in halos. So it's a very important mass scale. And now we ask the question, should this halo here be more likely to house a red galaxy than this halo here? So we know that the formation histories of these two halos are completely different. This is a young halo, this is an old halo. I'm actually pointing at one of the green dots, didn't matter which one. This is a young halo, this is an old halo. This had a tumultuous formation history, this had a very quiescent formation history. So the HOD assumption is that both of these halos are equally likely to house a red galaxy. There's no difference between the two. And that's simply because it was a statistical argument based only upon mass. So if I make that assumption that both of these halos are equally likely to have a red galaxy at their center, can I actually match the observed statistics? And these are the results. So once again, we start with a two-point correlation function. We have a bin uh, of galaxies from minus 19 to minus 20. So here's the two-point correlation function for blue and red. You know, once again, we get the expected results. So obviously, the red galaxies are much more clustered than the blue galaxies. And the lines are the best fit HOD models, which are given by these occupation functions. So now the mean occupation function looks a little bit different than what the plots I had shown you in previous slides. Uh, this is the central occupation function. It looks like a square well instead of a step function now because it's a bin. And halos brighter than 10 to the 12 simply have galaxies at their center which are too bright to fall in the bin. But what you see from these occupation functions is that for the central galaxies, most of them are blue. For the satellite galaxies, most of them are red. And since uh, the satellite galaxies are mostly found in these high-mass halos, that's why you get really strong clustering for the red galaxies and weak clustering for the blue galaxies. Just reproducing what we already know about the clustering of red and blue galaxies. But you'll see also that 30% of the central galaxies are still red. So if I go out into, my, into the universe and I find a 10 to the 11.5 solar mass halo, it's got a 30% chance of having a red galaxy at its center, regardless of the environment in which it formed. So if I calculate what the VPF is under that assumption, that's the solid lines here for red and blue galaxies. And the points are the, are the measurements, once again from DR4, and the predictions exactly lie with, with, uh, with the data, with good chi-square per degree of freedom. So the conclusion that you draw from this particular plot is that the field galaxy color is uncorrelated with formation history. It doesn't matter whether or not the halo itself formed tumultuously or is young or old, the age of the stars is independent of that. So, aye. Why did it do that? OK, something happened. Oh, well, OK. So back to the density morphology relation. So what was supposed to be right here was the, the plot from uh, Changbon Park where uh, they had the density morphology relation uh, from, that he calculated from Sloan, which you know was core. There was like a point here, a point here, a point here, something like that. Uh, I can make something sort of like that from, from my HOD models. I don't have. I don't have uh, uh, early type or late type, I have red and blue in my model. So I make something very similar. I have the red fraction as a function of environment from my model. Now, above the mean density, you get a strong correlation where the red fraction goes way up at high density regimes. Very simple to explain. The red galaxies are mostly in the high mass halos. The high mass halos are mostly found in the high density environments. And that's why you get this strong correlation. However, you can see there's a noticeable break at low densities. 
And the only reason that there's any slope at all here is that I calculated this in redshift space so I can compare it with the data. Redshift space smears things out so you don't know exactly what density it's in. But you'll reach some critical density scale where this should break from this. And the reason is if you go back to the occupation function, at some low density, you'll lose all your high mass halos. At low densities, you can only have low mass halos. So if you're at some density which you only have halos below 10 to the 12 solar masses, you are in the regime where it's just central galaxies. So there's only one galaxy per halo, and the properties of that galaxy are independent of the environment. And so you should no longer have any correlation with environment below this critical scale. So Changbaum was nice enough to give me his data so that I could re-bin it so I can look at really fine variations of the density morphology relation if I bin it up. And so this is now just a re-anal, or just simply a re-binning of the data from that Park et al. paper, where once again we've got the density on the x-axis and elliptical fraction on the y-axis. And you can see exactly what you would expect from this type of picture. Strong correlation of morphology with environment at the high density regime, but a significant break, and the slope basically becomes zero below low, at low densities. So the green line here is just a reproduction of this red line. It's only for qualitative comparison only, because um, it's not early type, it's red fraction, and the densities are calculated in a little bit different ways. So this is all work in progress, and we're going to try and incorporate this into our models and do some actual qu quantitative predictions. So the first part of my talk was, how do you actually make a field galaxy? What influences the properties of these galaxies? And it turns out the answer is predominantly halo mass. The mass in which a galaxy forms determines the luminosity over four magnitudes in R band. It determines the color of that galaxy. The age of the halo does not matter in determining the color of the galaxy. It seems to determine the morphology of the galaxy too. And the implication is that mergers, which we think transforms spirals to disk, or spirals to, to ellipticals, don't cause the morphological transformation of field galaxies because you get fewer mergers in underdense environments. Now, I have the question mark here because I haven't done the actual statistical comparisons yet, but it's work in progress. And then once we're done with that, the next thing to do is actually to go on to other properties which people claim correlate with environment very strongly, such as star formation rate or AGN activity. But unless you actually do this decomposition, like taking out the, uh, the effect of halo mass, and now the halo mass function changes with environment, you can't actually quantify how these properties truly depend on the environment in which the halo formed. So that's the first part of my talk. Are there any questions about that before I move on to the second part? OK. Magnesium-2 absorbers. It is related. It'll, I'll show you a little bit later. Uh, what is a magnesium-2 absorber? So, you have some quasar out at a redshift of like two or something like that, and it's shining big and bright. And the light is moving through the universe on its way to its rightful home in the Keck telescope. And along the way, it's going to pass close by to some galaxies. So here's a galaxy right here, and it sits in a dark matter halo. And if the light passes through the halo and there's some cold gas in it, you'll see some low ionization metal lines. So you'll see that in absorption in the quasar spectra once it actually hits your telescope back here at home. Now, it turns out that you don't actually have to have the Keck telescope in order to find these things. You can find them just fine in something like the Sloan spectra. So here's an example of that. Here is a uh, quasar at redshift 3. And you can see a blow up here of this magnesium-2 doublet, which is rest frame about 3,000 angstroms. And you can see it quite nicely. And it's an absorbing uh, object at a redshift of 0.8 along the line of sight. So the Sloan spectra actually smears these things out pretty good. Uh, but if you were to go back with really high-resolution spectroscopy and look at these absorption lines, they would get broken up into little itty-bitty components. So, and the total uh, equivalent width, the total amount of absorption you get is basically proportional to the little components that you have inside of the lines. It's sort of this picture here, where as the line of sight goes through the halo, it'll hit some clumps or clouds of gas, and each one of those would produce a little bit of absorption, which are smeared out in the Sloan spectrum. So that's sort of the general picture about what's going on. Now, I said you can actually find these things in Sloan data. Yes? Uh, is what is spectral about magnesium 2? Uh, it's easy to find uh, in, in, optical, uh, in the optical range. That's what makes it uh, special. Okay. Do you have a signal from there that's drawing the Sloan spectrum to find absorption? Find any absorption at all? Find the red line you see. For signal noise of 1? I don't know. Uh, that's other people's work. I just use the data that they give me. Um, so this is sort of a visualization of what's going on in Sloan. Uh, the red blotchy areas is sort of a smeared out version of the photometric LRG catalog. The lines are lines of sight towards quasars, which are way off in the distance. And then the little blue fuzzballs are the absorbers they find along the line of sight. 
so it's actually quite difficult to see what's going on here. So maybe this is a little bit better way to, to view the data. Uh, so you can see that um, I believe the way Mark did this, he actually sort of highlighted these things by equivalent width. So these are strong absorbers. And you can see the strong absorbers don't lie on top of the, on top of the clumps of LRGs, but they're also not in the, in the voids as well. So they're more of like an intermediate clustered population. Uh, I asked Mark this, and, and he sort of like is like, "Oh well, that's a complicated answer." Um, so this would have to be, you know, a group of allergies. So this is, you know, maybe 10, 20 megaparsecs. Oh, that way I don't know how deep it is. The the white lines are are lines of sight towards a quasar, way off that way. So it's cool. It's very difficult to do chi-square by eye with this, so, or cross-correlation by eye. So we'll have people do it statistically later on. So what do we think is going on when we see a quasar, when we see an absorption in the spectra of a quasar? So the canonical idea is if this line of sight passes through a low mass halo, the low mass halo will have, you know, uh, sort of a low column density of gas, a few of these clouds inside of it, and the velocity dispersion amongst the clouds will be small, and so you get a weak absorber measured in terms of its equivalent width in angstroms. The same line of sight goes through a really big halo, lots of gas, many of these clouds, large velocity dispersion, you have a very strong absorber. The canonical idea, therefore, is that equivalent width correlates with the halo mass. It's, it's a probe of the potential well depth in which the gas sits. That's the idea. So this is the current state of the art in terms of statistics about uh, these absorbers from Sloan, uh, either, I believe this is, these are both the R3 results. So here's the frequency function the number as a function of equivalent width, so I accidentally cut off the x-axis. This is equivalent width, same as the other axes. Um, and it's basically an exponential. You find a lot of these really weak absorbers, very few of these very strong absorbers. And then a nifty thing that Nicholas Boucher and collaborators did a couple of years ago is they now cross-correlated these to measure their clustering bias by cross-correlating them with the luminous red galaxy catalog. So what he finds is plotted here. Here's equivalent width in the x-axis. And then bias, B, I call it B hat, because it's bias relative to the LRGs uh, as a function of equivalent width. So the canonical idea is that big mass equals strong absorber. So you would think there would be a positive correlation here. But in fact, what he finds, very interestingly, is a negative correlation, an anti-correlation, where the strongest absorbers are actually in the lowest mass halos. And then when he uses some sort of like you know, mean max approximation, to infer uh, a mean logarithmic halo mass, um, he gets that between strong absorbers and weak absorbers, that the mean mass actually decreases by almost a decade from weak absorbers to strong absorbers. And I'll skip over the impact parameters for now. So why are these important? I should have put this slide a little bit either. Why are these things important? Well, one of the reasons you want to look at these absorbers is that it's a direct window into high Z galaxy formation. It's another way to reverse engineer the galaxy formation process. I mean. Every sight line is essentially a volume-limited sample all the way out to redshift 2.5. It's very hard to find galaxies that far, uh, that far out, very easy to find these, these absorbers. And the questions that we wish to answer through looking at these statistics, first one is, are these uh, absorption systems ubiquitous, or are they a special, set of, special subset of dark matter halos? One and another is, uh, what is the distribution of halo masses for this gas? Does it occupy a narrow range in halo mass or a wide range in halo mass? And then this anti-correlation, is a non-gravitational process required to create this anti-correlation? If equivalent width isn't probing the potential well depth, what is it probing? So if the statistics of these absorbers are a consequence of the halos in which the gas sits, then you should be able to have a halo model for this sort of thing. Um, so now, instead of Pn of m, where n was the number of galaxies, I now have Pw of m, where w is the equivalent width. It's the probability of giving an absorber of a given equivalent width and a halo of mass m. And it works very simply, just something like this. Here's your dark matter halo. You have a line of sight, which passes right through the center of the halo. So it's going to have the full, you know, it's passed through all the gas that's available inside of the halo. It's a very strong absorber. But it's actually very less, very low, like, very, has a very low likelihood, because the cross section at the center of the halo is very low. What's much more likely to happen is that a line of sight is going to pass through the edge of a halo, where you don't have a lot of gas there, so it's going to be a very weak absorber. So we know that the probability of a given impact parameter, S, is proportional to S. And then if you assume a density profile for the gas, which we just assumed an isothermal with a core, and you just shoot a bunch of random lines of sight through that halo, this is now the PDF of uh, equivalent with W. Strong absorption, very rare. Weak absorption, much more common. 
with something which basically goes as like WMM minus three in between. So now this is a halo model, so there's no physics. Remember, I must divorce myself from all the physics in order to constrain the parameters. So I want to take this PDF and say it's going to vary as a function of halo mass. I make it stronger or weaker absorbers and halos of different masses and leave these as free parameters. The first parameter is what I call AW of M. It's an absorption per unit, uh, surface density. Uh, it encompasses physical things inside of the halo like the cold gas fraction, these little cloud properties, how big they are, what's their cross section, and it turns into what you can think of as an absorption efficiency parameter. And if this was constant, if you had the same absorption efficiency in all halos of all masses, but the bigger halos had more gas, uh, W would co as you know, mass to the third power. It's the canonical idea that the equivalent width would go increase with the halo mass. So that uh, governs what the shape of this distribution is. Here is strong mean absorption, here is weak mean absorption. So the other free parameter that we've got is the incidence of absorption, this parameter kappa. Because there are two different things that go into the incidence. You might have a line of sight which goes through a halo, but not actually produce any absorption. And this can happen because the media is really, medium is really clumpy, so the gas might be there, you just didn't happen to hit any of it. So that's a covering factor. Or it might be just that only a small subset of these halos actually have extended uh, magnesium-2 gas halos around the galaxies, like maybe 10% or something like that. So you, these are completely degenerate, and you parameterize their product in terms of this instance rate, kappa g. So that just simply governs the amplitude of the PDF. So I got one, one parameter which governs the strength of the absorption in a halo of mass m, and one parameter which governs the probability of that absorption in a halo of mass m. The model is trying to make as few assumptions as possible about the actual mechanism which is producing the absorbers. I, don't, I can't really tell the difference, or I don't really want to tell the difference, between an inflow, an outflow, or anything like that. I want to have as free, as free from ideas like that as possible, just to make sure I get the right answer, and then I can compare with predictions later on. <clears throat> so let's look a little bit more at this uh, absorption efficiency parameter, AW of M. The first model that we tried is that uh, this the cold gas content probed by AWM is going to vary freely as a function of halo mass. So this goes back to you know, old uh, ideas by like uh, White and Frank with their semiolytic model of galaxy formation where gas comes into the halo, it's immediately shock heated to the virio temperature of that halo, and it cools from the inside out. And you know the density of the gas in the halo, you know the temperature you can calculate what the cooling radius is. So this cold gas would be the reservoir from which you can actually get this absorption. And that cold gas reservoir would vary smoothly as a function of halo mass. So we parameterize it as some sort of like a power law. Actually, we try to double power law. But you think you might be able to, to reproduce this by simply saying that this is going to be negatively sloped, that strong absorption efficiency would be at low mass and weak absorption efficiency would be at high mass. But when we put it all into the machinery, it turns out that this is the best fit model. You can't actually reproduce the, both the frequency function, which I haven't plotted here, you can't reproduce both the frequency function and the bias relation with a model that, which, which looks like this. You could force this to go through the data by saying that, well, uh, low mass halos are very, has very strong uh, absorption efficiency, but then I would completely overproduce the number of weak absorbers. Remember the number of strong, or completely overproduce the number of strong absorbers. Uh, remember the number of strong absorbers is very few. They're very infrequently found. But if they're all in all the low mass halos, you would way overproduce what's, absor what's observed about the frequency function. So we try this other model, where instead of just some freely varying function of halo mass, that the gas, the amount of cold gas in the halo has a critical transition between where most of the gas in the halo is predominantly cold to where suddenly, all, all of a sudden, most of the gas is predominantly hot. There is a critical transition cell between cold mode and hot mode. And this is coming from recent ideas about halo gas from, say, authors like Deckel and Birnbaum, or simulations done by Dushan Karas and collaborators, where they find that at low masses, you can't actually get this virial shock heating at the edge of the halo. At low masses, gas comes into the halo and is always cold all the way to the center, uh, all the way to the center of the halo, all the way onto the galaxy. It's only at a critical mass threshold where suddenly you can get these virial shocks, and after that point, then all the gas in the halo now becomes very hot, and you won't have very much cold gas from which to produce this absorption. Uh, it's at low masses. It's uh, it's like the compression time is uh, the critical mass would be where the compression time is equal to the the cooling time. It's that you can't you you might be able to start a shock, but you can't sustain it. 
so you were not able to actually consistently heat the gas. <clears throat> Bias relative to the LRGs. Maybe I should have just put BW divided by BLRG, but. About two, yeah. So we parameterize the second model based upon something like comes out of the SPH simulations. This is from the SPH simulations of Keres et al., where they've got uh, halo mass on the x-axis and the fraction of particles, gas particles, which are cold, which came into the halo cold, stayed cold, and went all the way to the center of the halo. Below 10 to the 11 solar masses, all the gas which comes into the halo is cold. And then between 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 12, that's where you now can get this virial shock heating. And the amount of cold gas rapidly drops uh, to you know, something almost zero, but not quite zero percent. All the way, you have this tail of cold gas particles, which extends all the way out, even above 10 to the 13 solar masses. These are now cold streams, where it's like filamentary accretion, where you get cold stream which can penetrate inside the virial radius and stay cold all the way down to the center of the halo. So we parameterize it by saying you've got this cold mode, and then suddenly you've got this critical transition where now you have shock heating, but there's still some, cold, some small amount of cold gas even in the hot mode halos. And here's the best fit model with this sort of parameterization. So we get pretty much a perfect uh, reproduction of the frequency function. And now this is what the bias function looks like in this, sort of, in this sort of transition model from cold to hot halos. So it's not a perfect representation of the bias function, but it is a chi-square of 3.5 for four data points. And you can see that the, the error bars are really, really small here, so that's going to be completely driving the fit. If we can reduce the error bars on these data, we'll be able to constrain this much better. Um, and if you look at the constraints we get from this model, what we find is that the amount of cold gas in the hot mode is 6% relative to what it was uh, at lower masses. And this transition mass, where shock heating becomes important, uh, that separates cold halos from hot halos is 10 to the 11.5 solar masses, which was exactly what was found in the SPH simulations. And this width between all cold and all hot is about one dex in mass. This all agrees very well with what comes out of the SPH simulations. Um, yes, if we were able to, to get measurements of that of the bias points at a lot of different redshifts, which we don't actually have, what comes out of the uh, the predictions is that it always pretty much always stays at the same place. So it depends on whether or not it depends a little bit on metallicity, but only to the point where at zero metallicity it's at a quite different mass. But if you did just trace amounts of metals, it uh, it pretty much goes up to the same place and stays there. So these are the constraints on the parameters from those data. This is kappa g. This was the incidence rate. And you can see that basically that at uh, low halo masses, the incidence rate pretty much falls to zero. So low, halos are, low mass halos are not producing to the contributing to the magnesium-2 absorption. But above, say, 11.5 solar masses, from 11.5 to 12.5 solar masses, the incidence rate has to be one, meaning every single halo which is hit along the line of sight must produce magnesium-2 absorption in order to account for the frequency statistics and the bias statistics. So this means this is a generic result of any process which goes into galaxy formation. It's not some special subset of galaxies. It has to be all of them in order to reproduce the statistics. So I will skip this part and go on to this. This is now the occupation function for absorbers. If you measure, if you find an absorber at 0.5 angstrom, this is the distribution of halo masses from which uh, that absorber came from. So at low masses, you start low where there's, you know, the kappa, kappa G goes way down, so you don't have any absorbers from low masses. Suddenly, it goes up very high. You get a lot of absorbers between 10 to the 11 and 10 to the 12 solar masses. And then suddenly, you hit 10 to the 12 solar masses. That's where the transition happens between cold to hot halos. And it just, the shock heating slams it down. And you almost get rid of all of the absorbers, except there's that small fraction of gas, which is in the high mass halos. And so you get this tail of weak absorbers all the way out to 10 to the 13 and 10 to the 14 solar masses. Now, for strong absorbers, like two angstroms, they're only going to be found at the downside of this transition mass. And they're not going to be found up in the high mass regime. But you can have the weak absorbers in both low masses and in high masses. So this exactly actually explains where you get this anti-correlation. So uh, Boucher, who uh, did these measurements, interpreted this as being evidence of starburst, that the only way you can get these strong absorbers in the low mass halos were outflow, were outflow winds. 
Now, that could be the case, but it's not actually necessary. These data do not necessitate that in sort of interpretation. For two angstrom absorbers, that's about the same as a velocity width of about 200 kilometers a second, which is less than uh, twice the circular velocity of a 10 to 11 solar mass halo. And also, remember, as Pat pointed out, this is biased relative to LRGs, which have uh, a bias of two. So this is basically uh, an unbiased sample of galaxies, an unbiased sample of halos. So you can produce this point through any model just randomly sampling a bunch of random halos. The important point for the anti-correlation is this one here. So this is a relative bias of 0.8 with respect to LRGs. These are massive galaxies and high mass halos. And so these weak absorbers, which are the majority of absorbers, have to lie in, in halos that are roughly the same mass. So the way you produce this anti-correlation is from trace amounts of cold gas that are actually in the same halos as LRGs, and so they have a high relative bias. And when you calculate the cross-correlation function, which I haven't actually plotted here, but the two-point correlation function uh, between LRGs and magnesium-2 absorbers, you find pairs inside that one halo term that I talked about earlier, saying that these objects, the, the LRGs and the absorbers, must be residing in the same halo. Um, so in the last couple of minutes, I guess I'll just show a couple of slides from the paper that came out yesterday on AstroPH. Well, we're now trying to test some of the assumptions which went into that model. So we went out and did some uh, did spectroscopy of galaxies that are near nearby quasar lines of sight to see if we can find what exactly this incidence rate is and how it correlates with impact parameter. So these, this is the sample of galaxies that we found, which are uh, about 23 galaxies, which are within 100 kiloparsecs of six quasar lines of sight. And so this is the impact parameter. So that's uh, the distance between the quasar line of sight and the galaxy that we observed. And here is the equivalent width uh, of the magnesium-2 absorption. This is supposed to be an unbiased sample of galaxies, of galaxy absorber pairs, meaning that we start with the galaxy sample and then look for an absorber. Now, another way of doing it is if you start with an absorber and look for a galaxy, that ends up with biased, can, it can end up with biased results. So if you start with the galaxies, it's an unbiased sample. These upper limits are non-detections where we found no, uh, no equivalent, no absorption. And it looks kind of like a mess here. At first glance, you'd say, well, the incidence rate is about 50%. 50% of the time you find absorbers here, but you've got these down here. But we know that these are all in different sized halos. Low luminosity galaxies are in small mass halos. High luminosity galaxies are in big halos. And so the gas radii should be bigger in the high mass halos. So now if you scale this, this x-axis, by luminosity, where this is uh, a number which comes from maximum likelihood fitting, you end up with something like this, where now this is uh, a best fit line, which is our isothermal plus core model that we had for our halo. It's just a simple model, but actually seems to fit the data quite well. And you have this hard cutoff at about 100 kiloparsecs, or about 40% of the virial radius, beyond which you find no absorption. This scaling here of 0.14 times the magnitude of the galaxy relative to M star is essentially the same as scaling by halo radius, because the, the magnitude of a galaxy basically scales as the virial radius, uh, one-sixth of the virial radius. And that result comes from halo occupation modeling. So it's the same as scaling, the, scaling this axis by the virial radius of the halo. So inside of 100 kiloparsecs, or 0.4 times the virial radii, all galaxies basically produce this magnesium-2 absorption showing an agreement with the results we got a couple of slides ago that the incidence rate for these types of galaxies has to be 100%, outside of which you don't get any. This little outlier here is a known damp Lyman alpha system, and so probably the galaxy was right on top of the quasar, and so we couldn't actually find it. So then when we looked for, uh, so it's actually a wrong assignment. This is the wrong galaxy to actually assign with that absorber. Because you're never going to find a damp Lyman alpha system at, at 100 kiloparsecs, because the ELAs are when you actually pass through the disk of a galaxy. So that would be like 10 kiloparsecs or less. And statistically, it's exactly what you expect. Some of the time, this is going to happen. OK, so just to summarize this part, um, we can actually model the absorber statistics with a halo-based model and actually get both the frequency function and this bias anti-correlation correct. Uh, the high covering fraction means that uh, the absorbers are representative of all galaxies above 10 to 11 uh, solar masses. And this bias anti-correlation can only be fit with a cold-hot transition and having some remnant of cold gas inside the hot halos. Starbursts do not necessarily create the anticorrelation. And we can carry on this work by combining this part of the talk with the first part of the talk, in which I am actually constraining the halo occupation of galaxies and make predictions for the galaxy absorber connection. So, thank you.
Yes. Mm -hmm. However, in this picture, I understand there's something which just escapes me because if you look at a little bit of physics, the real real temperature of a 10 to solar mass halo is still millions of degrees, a million degrees or something. And even in 2011, that's you know 100,000 degrees, and I, I think maybe even two um, existential temperature ranges of 2,000 Kelvin, isn't it? And then it's just you've got those big range of magnesium. So just in order to make it exist at all, you have to say that this magnesium really isn't part of the halo; it's living in some cloud. Okay, I, well, I, uh, all right, so let's see, I have a long, <laughs> let's, go, let's go back to the very low temperature first. I, I don't actually remember it off the top of my head, but I didn't think the 10 to the 12 was, the 10 to the 12 solar mass halo was, was a million degrees. Well, yeah, I didn't. Uh, all the Milky Way is in the third halo, which is like a million degrees. Okay, okay, so uh, I mean, the, the Milky Way would be about here yeah. on the other side of the, of the shock radius. Yeah, but it's, but it's, it's actually a million degrees. Right, so the, but the gas comes in cold and, and it, it there's no, here, there's no, there's no shock heating, so it can't actually get heated up to the very low temperature. It's just going to come in and sink in. Right, the only place, the very low temperature is only relevant beyond the shock, beyond the, the shock scale, where you can actually get very low shocks. Correct. Shocks, shocks cannot be. Well, every halo shocks, but below below that halo mass, shocks are dissipated away too fast to be sustained. Um, I mean, that, that's that's just the work from from Deckel and Bernboim, the analytic work, and then you know reproduced almost exactly in in, in SPH simulations. Right here, showing that, that at 10 to 11 solar masses, all the gas is cold. It doesn't get shock heated. So, you know, by the time you get to 10 to the 12, at that point, then you have, then you have full shock heating of the halo. And then it's transitioning between those two regimes, between 10 to the 11 and 10 to the 12 solar masses. Yeah, I, cold. Is, yeah, cold means that it never went above uh, a million degrees. It never went. Um, well, I mean, if you if you look at like uh, density temperature diagrams, all of these particles. Well, I shouldn't actually draw it, but yes, these things stay at ten to the four, and these are particles that are heated up to ten to the six, or you know, one minus f is things that are being heated up to ten to the six. It's just surprising because zero of ten to the four. Right, but if there are no shocks, then how does the gas get, he get heated? Well, as, as I said, the gas in the absence of radiative properties, the, the shock doesn't care about the um, mass. You know, all, they all here are very similar, so they all go in and convert their kinetic energy into the gravitational potential, as we did earlier, just which, whatever, at least, but maybe that's okay. I mean, that's just you know, based on saying that um, these arguments are just not correct. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I, I don't remember. 
exactly, you know, the exact the, the line of reasoning that Declan Birnbaum had, but it has to deal with, you know, the density inside of the halo, which isn't okay, so exactly self similar. Like, okay, the, yeah, then there's the second part where, okay, so they don't have to be they don't have to be self gravitating. Right? They, they don't have to be associated with a, like a piece of substructure or anything like that. Like gas will come in as accreted and um, by, it doesn't have to, you know, it doesn't have to be inside of a, a hot medium in order to create these balls of gas. It can actually be pressure confined by turbulent pressure. And that's how you get these like multi-component clumps inside of coal gas inside of a halo which doesn't actually have a hot medium inside of it. And also if you're at the edge of the halo, it doesn't necessarily have to be have to be clumps. It can be, you know, diffuse gas also. Now there probably was more, but I don't remember. And but let's go to Neil. Uh, no, I haven't, but uh, definitely it seems possible. Uh, we don't have a really, as you can see, we don't have a really good handle on the incidence rate inside of 10 to the 14, but uh, I would say at least 10% of the time but in something. Yes. Uh, well, my recollection of whenever people make plots like that, it's just a big scatter plot. So, so when, when I uh, think back to the last paper I looked on this, and I can never remember how to pronounce the guy's name, Kaperchak, what's the, how do you, do you yeah, know how to pronounce that guy's name? Yeah. All right, if anybody knows how to pronounce that guy's name, please tell us. Uh, but it looked as, to me, when I, when I looked at his data, it seemed like it was obvious that there was an anti-correlation between luminosity and equivalent width, which is what you would get from this. And, but they only fit things that were positively sloped. Down to what equivalent width? Uh, above 0.3? Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, Steiner's like 97. You know, so there is a lot of scatter, but if you look at the mean, it's 50.5. Okay. So, but if you're looking at, say, 10 to the 13. You're also looking at mean masses. Um, so the mean of the mass. Hmm? You are considering the mean mass um, of that solar. No, I mean, this is supposed to be the mass distribution. Right, Boucher does it in a completely different way that yeah. how he gets these. He just, he says this bias corresponds to some halo mass on a halo mass function, on a, on a halo bias plot. And he just reads off what that is. That's essentially all he's doing. But what I'm to say is that the trend is, I mean, because of the mass is very different. So, so, but if you, if you, if there are absorbers in, in uh, halos above, 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14 solar masses, it's possible that you would then find that the closest galaxy to the absorber would be a satellite galaxy, which is by definition going to be less luminous. And you know, the, mean, the mean luminosity of satellite galaxies is basically constant. 
So most of the time you're going to be associating uh, an absorber with a satellite galaxy in these halos, and, and then the trend should be flat. Okay. Oh, it'd be a chi-square of like nine or something like that, between six and nine. 